yes, hi, the webinar is live. I'm going to wait just probably a minute, uh, waiting for the attendee count to go up, after which I'll start with the introductions. I can already see uh, a lot of attendees are joining in right now. Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to Be Wastewise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am one of the community builders at Be Wastewise. Uh, some of you would have seen me on other webinars. Today, we have Shian Kafi Young, who's a co founder of CL Environmental Solutions, uh, who is moderating the webinar. The topic that Shian has chosen today is NGOs and waste management in the Caribbean. She is talking to Danny McLechi. She's a co founder of Carne Cycle. Kalia Hall, sustainable, Sustainability Manager of Esrom Foundation Limited, and Rosalyn George, who's the Director of Cashew Gardens Community Council. Um, we're very excited for this webinar. I think it's a very interesting topic, and we also have an all-women panel, which I'm, uh, which is interesting in its own way. Uh, just uh, a reminder to everyone who's attending, if you have not seen Shion's webinars in the past, please head to the webinar section on our website, and you will find them there. You'll find uh, she's moderated quite a few webinars for us in the past, all of which deal with the Caribbean. And all of our speakers will share their LinkedIn IDs or emails towards the end of the webinar. So if you want to get in touch with them, you will have a way of getting in touch with them. And uh, please drop your questions in the Q&A section. We use chat for other conversations and to introduce ourselves. So over to you, Sean. Thank you so much. And hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining our conversation today. Today, we are going to be talking about NGOs in waste management. So yes, as we just indicated, please let us know from where your ears are coming from. And so we would love to, to see what countries, what cities are represented here in the conversation. I know you'll probably have a special place in your heart for the Caribbean region. And so we are so happy to, to have you on the call with us today. So I already see Mark says that he is from the UK. So guys, you can use the chat and let us know from where you are from. It's always amazing to see uh, greetings from Lagos, Nigeria. I actually was in Hi Charlotte, Hi Renan, Hi Ngozi. Nice to meet you all. I actually was in Abuja, Nigeria, uh, a couple months ago in May. I've never yet to come across the Lagos and Bosby, so I'll do that soon. Um, so we have Yvette from the Dominican Republic, Alina from Romania. So guys, you see where people are joining us from, right? All over the world. This is truly an uh, international conversation. So as we just said, I'm joined um by my wonderful wonderful some of my favorite people uh in the in Trinidad Tobago and in the NGO space we have Roslyn who is from Trinidad we have Danny McClechi who is also from Trinidad and we have Kalia Hall who is coming to us from Yard as they say from all the way from Jamaica so guys let us jump right into the conversation so this question is for each of you so I will start with you uh, Rosalind, first. So, can you tell us? And uh, I'm gonna challenge you, all right? So, tell me in thirty seconds about what your organization does. And so my, name is Rosalind. my name is Rosalind George. I belong to an organization called Cashew Gardens Community Council. Cashew Gardens is a community-based organization, and we help the community manage waste from the household level. Because what we've realized is if we have to get serious about upcycling, recycling, and composting, then the waste have to be sorted from the kitchen. Because when everything is mixed together and it's already contaminated, it's, or it's too late to do anything about it. It's too much work. So it's easier. So we focus a lot on community-based training. Uh, from the household level, we do a lot of work with children because we realize they're the ones who would enforce the change in the household because after all, the future belongs to them. So this is what Cashew Gardens, it's also a woman-led organization, and we are operating out of Chagornas, Trinidad, and Tobago. 30 seconds. Thank you for your one time in the web, but I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rosa and Kalia, your turn. Tell us a little bit more about the organization. Hello, everybody. 
Hi, morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. My name is Kalia Hall. I'm from the Essiram Foundation in Jamaica. So we are a non-profit environmental organization, and I normally touch on our three pillars of work. So the first one is environmental conservation and protection. A project in that area is our Kingston Harbor Eco Restoration Initiative. Jamaica's largest harbor and the seventh largest harbor in the world and educate students and communities near the harbor not to dump their garbage in the gullies. Our second pillar of work is sustainable consumption. So we have a Bring Your Own Things campaign in standard English, Bring Your Own Things, where we encourage Jamaicans to bring their own reusables when they go out to eat and drink to cut back on plastic consumption. And our third pillar is urban planning and a main part free water for all so those of you in Europe and in larger cities would be familiar with you know free water dispensers whether in airports or in the middle of a city in Jamaica we don't typically have those free and available for the public outside of office spaces so we would love to offer that offer that in public or outdoor spaces to also cut back on plastic consumption hope I stick to the 30 second <laughs> time <laughs> you, I appreciate it uh, Donnie, <laughs> your turn. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Thank you, Sean and Suta. Uh, my name is Dani McClechi. I am the CEO and co-founder of Karna Cycle. We're a Trinidad and Tobagonian organization working to make Caribbean carnivals sustainable. And if you don't know what that is, later I could just throw up my screen to show you what that is, but we work to make Caribbean um, carnivals and festivals around the globe more sustainable through um, two flagship activities. One would be costume recycling. So we actually collect the costumes, the used costumes after carnival, recycle them, and then we sell them back um, to designers and creatives. And then we also have a costume donation program where those same materials are donated to schools, theaters, and other um, uh, organizations and schools that can't afford to buy their own craft material. So I could tell you a lot more later, but I'm trying to stick to the 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Danny. I'm Kelia. Okay. So guys, that's a reminder as well that if you have any questions that come up during the course of the conversation, please put them in the Q&A box. That's just easier for me to manage. Okay, so um, our next question is, you know, what do you see as the role of NGOs in the waste management sector? We know that waste management is very broad. It's a very broad sector. Um, and we have multiple players in the space, right? I run a social enterprise, a for-profit social enterprise. And we also have nonprofits such as yourselves. We have people who are at the policy end. We have people who are processors. So the, the, the glamour is wide. But what do you guys specifically see as the role of nonprofits in this sector? So Danny, as you're on the screen, we'll start with you. Um, I think I want to back up a little bit. <laughs> um, first, I want to kind of explain what I see as maybe the government's role in waste management, which would be to establish like the policies um, in the whole country would adhere to. So, you know, what to recycle, um, what is not acceptable in the landfills, um, what's being able to be imported and exported out the country. Um, from there, I feel like NGOs work could be um, way more effective than it is currently. But basically, I think the NGOs work is to um, enforce those policies or until those policies are created, enforce waste policies in local areas. Um, I feel like it takes the the nation um, and NGOs play a vital role in their specific local communities. So like if you're in Tobago, right? There's different culture in Tobago than probably South Trinidad or North Trinidad. And having an NGO in all three of those areas 
are going to effectively reach the people in the ways that, you know, they can be reached. Um, they're able to collect specific material that that community might be able to generate. Um, and they're able to do so because they know the community. The government might not know all these intricate details that these NGOs operating in these local spaces do know. So I think it's important that NGOs um, are able to uh, like be alive and active um, because they're important. They, they know about the culture and the space and the waste that is generated from those areas. But I think that NGOs and the government should collaborate and partner together so that they can get funding and they're able to like um continue their efforts over the long time because and you know it still takes money to operate NGOs and most NGOs um don't have an arm where they're generating money to sustain their operations um which is something that you know that that should happen but um NGOs are important because they they know the the ecosystem in which they're operating in. Thank you so much. I'm going to touch on that point in terms of the kind of support that NGOs need, right? So keep your answer to that question right at the top of mind. So Kenya, from, from your perspective in Jamaica, you know, from the way that you've seen things happening, what do you think is the role of NGOs in the sector? So I think I have a different perspective because one, Ethereum Foundation is a part of a group of companies and those other companies are for-profit companies, they're businesses. Um, and in the foundation, we also work a lot with corporate Jamaica. So businesses where profit is a priority. And I would say it's what's unique in the work that we do is we take profits out of the equation. So every single day when we're making our decisions, when we're picking projects to work, work on, when we're thinking about the best way to truly tackle an issue, we can just think of it from that perspective alone and not have to consider profits or meeting these financial targets. And I think that's super important in this consumerist money-driven society that we live in today. Um, I think what's also unique is that working with corporate Jamaica, again, CSR is a big term. Um, a lot of businesses are trying to do a project in that area to simply tick a box to say, yes, we did it. Um, whereas NGOs, it is the core of their work. Day in and day out, they're working to tackle issues in waste management or otherwise across a wide range of topics. But the point is every single day we're working on it and it's not just because it's World Environment Day or World Water Day that we're choosing to do something or post something. It's really at the core of what we do. So I think that's what's important. That's the important role we play in this huge ecosystem. Thank you so much, Julia. Master, what is your, what is your perspectives in terms of the roles of NGOs and waste management? For starters, I think NGOs are really underestimated and what we contribute to the in you know in the larger scheme of things. As far as we are concerned, a lot of what we do starts from the community level. And sometimes we take a top-down approach in terms of managing things in a country where we need to take a more bottom-up approach. Because being on the ground at the grassroots level, we live it, you see it, <laughs> we experience it. And this is where change has to be enforced first. A lot of times we think change starts with policy. But in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a lot of policies, we have a lot of laws, we have a lot of things on the books, but are they implemented? And this is where the challenge is. So I think the NGOs need to be given way more support to help enforce policy and to help actually do the work and get the change at this level. Sometimes we underestimate the amount of waste that is generated from an average community. We have started our program in 2016 and so far, we have re removed over 100 tons of plastic bottles from a community of 350 households. I mean, think of it. So at the, at the grassroots level, at the NGO level, I think we need to band together. We need to shout a little louder about some of the challenges that we face. We do a lot of work with very little support because a lot of people think that, okay, NGO is volunteerism. 
but I don't know how the gas will get into the car. <laughs> you know, how would we actually get things done if we don't get financial support? So um, we need to do a lot more work to highlight exactly what is going on. And this is why, you know, I appreciate something like this where we have the webinar and we could just keep talking and hope that eventually someday somebody would listen and understand our worth and our importance in the larger scheme of things. Maybe one day, Rosalind, I'll have a second thing just for NGOs, right? <laughs> so you all can already have, hold the microphone and be able to voice your concerns too. Not just your concerns, but your, your successes and everything that comes along with it, you know, because you you all talked about, you know, Rosen, you talked about being at the grassroots level and feeling the effects of the work that you do. And and Kelly, I was talking about that as well. You know, you you're seeing it, you're living it, you are it. And so because of that, you need to be supported. I mean, I don't like this word, but it came to my head while all while all three of you were speaking. I also see NGOs as the watchdogs of the issue. You guys are the ones who drive the work but also can take a step forward to, to show them, okay, listen, this is the this is the, the, the challenges that we face. These are the challenges that we face. This is the support that we need. We are here. We work in the community. Everybody knows who we are. We don't have to bring some stranger from somewhere else. We will work with the community to get things done. You know, so I don't like the word in my mind. Um, I am a dog person, so I heard like the Belgian malamans of the era. You know, um, but it is important the work that you and that's why I chose this topic today because it really is important that I like get shown the work that you guys are doing. So, and I see some other people have have joined the conversation, so I just want to welcome. Everybody who just joined us, we are talking about NGOs in the waste management space, specifically in the Caribbean region. So as we talked about uh, challenges, right, I want each of you to highlight your top priority challenge, because I know that the challenge list can get a little long if we keep going, right? So Rosalind, as you uh, in front of me on screen right now, we'll start with you. So what do you see? Uh, give me, I'll give you, because that's so nice. I'll give you all two. What are your top two challenges that you have experienced? Well, actually, no, I'll change it. I'll change it because I can do it. I'm the moderator. So I want you to give me one challenge and one opportunity. What is the challenge that you, uh, what is your top priority challenge that you have experienced? And what is the opportunity that you see moving forward for your organizations as well? So each of you think of your answers are coming at you. Russell? Okay, sure. So what I would say is one of the top challenges that we face, it will always be funding for us. Funding, funding, funding. The reason is um, we, we have done a lot of work over the years and we have seen the results, but we, we get, depend on grant funding and grant funding is for a project. Now, there isn't any opportunity at the moment to sustain what we do. There isn't any price put on plastic bottles, glass bottles, all of the things we collect and just make sure that it is removed from the community and deposited in a sustain an environmentally sustainable way. There isn't a, a monetary value placed on that in Trinidad and Tobago. So there, when you apply for grants and you get a grant to do a project and the project is done, now you can't ask people <clears throat> to unrecycle or to, you know, all of the work that you've done and help them to build sustainable habits. Now they're recycling and they're composting and they're sorting from the household and everybody's excited about it and then the money done. What do you do? You know, when the funding runs out, how can you sustain yourself? And to answer your other question, because I don't want to, you know, deliberate on the topic for too much. Collaboration, I think, is one of the opportunities that we can see going forward. So for instance, the Cashew Gardens uh, Community Council have been collaborating with Flying Tree Environmental as of late. And Flying Tree Environmental is an organization that now converts the plastic and turns it into lumber and creates upcycled material. So we have seen where we can actually take, now there is still no monetary exchange because they are too an NGO. So, but we have seen where, okay, perhaps if we collaborate more, and in the future going forward, there may be some opportunities where we can now sustain our project in a, you know, 
in a more um, viable way going forward. What another issue that I wanna highlight is your staff, you know, people need to live. And when you don't have a way of sustaining your project, persons would go on and get other employment. So now you have to depend on a little two hours in the evening and Sunday when they're free and that affects your organization in a really big way. So those I would say are my challenge and the opportunity. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Over to you. So I think Rosalind, of course, touched on what's going to be a big issue or what is a big issue for NGOs. So you took the words right out of my mouth in terms of funding. That's, I said it the other day to someone, you know, if we just had more funding, we could do so much more. And that's what holds us back in a lot of areas. But I'll touch on something else since you spoke on that. And it's um, how many different stakeholders are involved in, if we want to address the problem, um, you know, in an effective way, it will require government support, business support, support from the public and behavior change or work on the NGO side. It's, it's so many different people involved. And sometimes it's hard to get everyone on the same page. So for example, let's talk about the plastic problem, you know, or project, the Kingston Harbor Eco Restoration Initiative, Perry for short. Um, an issue we have in Jamaica and maybe in Trinidad as well and other Caribbean islands is the dumping of garbage in our gullies. So either because of maybe lack of waste collection, you know, lack of access to those communities from the waste management agencies in, in countries, or just bad habits, Jamaicans later. To this day, people will be driving and you see them throw a bottle out their window. So that's also at the core of it. But our gullies get filled with garbage and then when the rain falls, all the garbage washes out into the harbor, into our oceans, and that's a really big problem. Um, so, you know, we cleaned up, we, we started a project to clean up the garbage, but we know that's tackling the problem downstream. So we're like, you know, how do we go further upstream? Let's educate the, these communities. So we educate, we have an educational program where we teach them to use reusables and, you know, how long plastic takes to degrade, all the basic information. But even when they have that information, it's hard in the society that we live in to, today where plastic is everywhere and in everything to avoid it completely. I, as someone, for example, who I'm trying to reduce my plastic consumption as much as possible, still find myself having to purchase items that I don't want to purchase just because there isn't an alternative right now. So there's only so much we can do. Uh, businesses would have to change as well and want to find an alternative to using plastic for everything to make it easier for individuals as well as consumers when we purchase to give us more options and the government support. But you know, the whole multi-stakeholder involvement in the issue is is a big pain point as well. But it's also an opportunity. So you said opportunities. We, yeah. Right, exactly. So we work very, very closely with NSWMA, which is the National Solid Waste Management Agency in Jamaica. Um, and that's been huge for us. You know, they, that collaboration makes a lot of, of projects easier because we want to help them and they want to help us. And they're a government agency. So but it's one it's one collaboration you know imagine if we times that by 10 how much more we could get done thank you Danny. okay so similar to the other um two panelists funding is a, a is a problem as well but i would like to say it sort of in a different way um so it, it's two things <laughs> and the other thing is what rosalind said is said um as well which is the part-time workers <laughs> so um in terms of funding again current cycle operates in the model where we're not trying to rely solely on funding and i've seen examples of this work with ngos like i went to uh seattle and there is an ngo who um taught uh immigrant a uh, woman who came into Seattle how to sew. They did like a four week sewing class and um, 
They were able to get used textiles from big companies and corporations and then um, make upcycled items um, using the woman's skills. And then those upcycled creations were sold. And then they also sold tours of the facility in which the whole construction is going down. So effectively, they were getting funding from these companies. They were getting um, product to make things from the company, but they were also selling and trying to create a, a way to sustain themselves. And I feel like in the sustainability space, we should still be sustainable, you know, operation wise. And so I think funding is an issue um, for Karna Cycle specifically. We make money in two ways. We, again, we, we collect um, and recycle the carnival costumes. Um, and throughout the year, we sell that. So let's say Trinidad Carnival is in February. You know, we will collect like, you know, five to 6,000 costumes. That's the most we've ever collected so far in one one carnival. Um, and then throughout the year, we're inventorying and sorting costumes. We also get um, unsold costumes from mass bands. So mass bands participate in our program as well. And then we have a year round donation bin. So throughout the year, people are cleaning out their homes and they could come and drop off their costumes. And so throughout the year, we have work actually, not just after carnival time, but you know, selling costumes has been a way to help sustain ourselves, um, to then also donate to the theater groups, the schools, people who are doing um, uh, pageant shows, we've donated to them because, you know, that's part of their craft. Um, um, but then also we offer consulting services as well. So capitalizing on the, um, the knowledge that we have within the organization, um, to consult with designers and mass bands on how to make the costumes more sustainable from the start. So I feel like um, funding is an issue, but for us, it's a little bit different because we try to offset the funding with some entrepreneurial activities. I think where funding would help us, though, is to scale our operations. But that's a two-part problem because in order to scale the operations, we need to have full-time employees, which we do not have. <laughs> I myself am not full-time. My co-founder is not full-time. The other three people are all part-time. And as Rosalind mentioned, when you have people who are not like 100% in an NGO, it's hard to take it from like great to like super amazing. You need full-time staff to effectively run um, a really great NGO and then funding injected into that would really blow it up. So it's, it's a two part thing. I can't be full time because it's not making enough money for me to leave my job nor anyone else. Um, so it's like it's like those are the two problems that we have and they go hand in hand. Um, so if you know we got uh, an injection of funding to be able to scale our operations um and scale how we were able to like promote the services that would make us sustainable that would help us donate more it would help us sell more and then it would help us convert you know not even me but just our part-time staff into full-time staff and then they could be running the operations and I could be helping coordinate so those are the two issues I find. <laughs> I see. Okay, and then you still have to tell me what the opportunity. So what, what do you see as the opportunity um, in the midst of all of that happening? What do you see? Um, oh, sorry, sorry. So yeah, so well, definitely again, um, a, an injection of funding. And then um, uh, secondly, uh, even more collaboration. As Rosson also mentioned, we have partnered with Flying Tree, but we've tried to make it a model, again, where we would like to see for ourselves. So um, Flying Tree helps us uh, collect the costumes during the carnival season. So we actually pay them to set up collection bins throughout all of Port of Spain at our partner 
um, locations. Like we partner with Hyatt um, and the um, Hilton and local restaurants and local mass bands. And we, we all put recycling bins all over the main city of Port of Spain and Flying Tree will do that work. Um, and we pay them, but obviously a subsidized fee to pay to set up, uh, collect, and then transport the costumes to our warehouse. And um, the opportunity, um, that's just one end of, you know, that's just the beginning of our collection phase. So there's opportunity throughout the entire T of our collection phase for more collaboration. Okay, great. So the two things that stood out were funding in terms of challenges. Uh, Katie, you talked about essentially stakeholder management um, and the fact that there's too many multiple players involved. We talked about staffing um, and that being a double-edged sword with the funding because the funding helps you get the full-time staff and, and so you need that to be able to drive and to grow and to scale and to do more work. Um, and you know, one of the things uh, Julia, as we're talking about the carry program um, and the fact that, you know, you're collecting the materials from in the gullies, but you have to go upstream and you started educating. You know, one of the things that I always say that you have to be mindful of is that an increase in knowledge does not correlate to a change in behavior. So not because people know would they change how they behave. And so there are multiple things that have to be done in order for that behavior change to really start happening. Because if we think of our own selves, we think that, you know, I tell, I always use the example to me, I don't like taking medicine. I don't like taking tablets, especially. And my doctor knows me so well, he's like, ha, don't stop taking the medicine as soon as you start to feel better. Take the full course. <laughs> I know that, but you know, so, but now, because, it, it, it's a repetitious action. No, I don't. Okay. If you prescribe seven days of antibiotics, I need to take the full seven days. I can't just take, I started to feel better by day four. I don't, you know, so you have to be mindful of that. And one of the things that, um, you know, you spoke about in terms of your own journey, Kelly, with having to buy certain products because they're not available. We talked about that. That speaks to, you know, extended producer responsibility and having producers and items take responsibility from cradle to grave, from the beginning to the end, but also really holding there and really adopting the circulation as it as it needs to be, so that we have more options that are available. And guys, if you if you have any questions again, I saw Peter put in the chat, but I'm just continuing to reiterate the stream of conversation. If you have any questions that, come, that is coming up for you during the course of the discussion, you can put them in the Q&A box of the chat. So next question for all of you is, what do you see as the advantages of the disadvantages? Because I added this question because I really, I really like hearing the answers. I like asking my questions because I like hearing the answers, right? You know, what are the advantages? For you for running an, an, an NGO, but also what are the disadvantages? I think you all touched on it a little bit when you start talking about uh, your challenges that you would have faced, right? So, what do you see uh, the advantages for you for running a non profit organization um, in the Caribbean region, in Trinidad, in Jamaica? Uh, but what do you also see as the disadvantages if, if you do see any? If there is none, then you can feel free to say, Sean, I don't have to disadvantage. No, everything is an advantage, right? Right? But, so, what are they? So, Kelly, I'll start with you. Like, what do you see as the advantages for you, for, for, for you guys, you and Alex, you know, leading the charge as a wrong? And what do you see as the disadvantages? Kelly? I would say the advantages are the impact from the work. That you do of course that's that's why we do it you know that's there's so many problems in the world you know and you you can select an area that you feel um very passionate about or that you see a dire need to address um and then you, you tackle it you know while the the downside of course is that you're dependent on funding and grants and like Danny does, you know, maybe you have to sell merch or find other income streams. 
um, to support it. But at the core of it, you're, you're creating change where change needs to be imparted. Um, in Jamaica specifically, I mean, our waste industry is basically non-existent. We recently started recycling, which is great, but even recycling isn't a solution to our waste problem. You know, we've seen the statistics that less than 10% of the plastic that's recycled actually gets recycled. And so it's, it's we have to, as I said, work further upstream. Find, and I know it, it feels um, impossible, but if we could find an alternative to plastic, I know plastic has so many benefits um, and uses across industries, but what a different world we would be living in if, if you know, that could be possible, if that were possible, and it can be. You know, we just have to have more persons like us working in the space. So, um, yes, it's a change that's needed for, or if I ever have children, for my children to live in a world that I'm pro leaving behind for them. And also giving and treating the earth the way, you know, she treats us because we get so much from the earth. We exploit it for so many resources. I'm not realizing what it does in return for us. So it's it's the work. And specifically in the Caribbean, um, in Jamaica, for example, we feel like a big fish in, you know, small seas. Uh, our messages get heard very easily because Jamaica is so small. And, you know, people talk, the message spreads. People say, oh, we saw that campaign. We, we've, you know, changed this behavior. Now we carry this with us in terms of like their reusables. And so it's very heartwarming to see a simple social media post have such a great impact because the community is so small. So I'd say that's the advantage being in Jamaica and the Caribbean at large. Okay, great. So I was going to ask you, Talia, as you have so what happened to the Not Dirty of Jamaica campaign? That was just a short lived campaign that doesn't, it still doesn't happen right now. It's no longer. Tell me, what's, what's mm. going on with that? Because when I saw that, I was like, and then I'm talking about it. So, Nodotia of Jamaica okay. is a campaign that was started by the Jamaica Environment Trust. So, it's JET. It's another NGO um, right. to encourage Jamaicans not to litter and treat their, mm -hmm. you know, improve environmental stewardship. Um, In terms of what's happening with it, I can't tell you because... I am not working on the campaign, but um, I mean, we still see little signs about Kingston, small signs, no doubt of Jamaica, but I'm not sure about the status of that. Okay, that is more I just, I do love, um, I am an advocate for us incorporating our culture into our campaign. Um, it really is important because we want to build connection. If people become connected to and to then you would see them changing their actions around that particular issue. And so if we feel connected to it because that is strongly who we are as Jamaican people or the strongly who we are as Trini or Haitian or, you know, Haitian or, you know, people from uh, the Dominican Republic, then it all goes well because people can feel a connection to it because it, it, is, it, is, it is a part of their, you know? So I just thought that it just, let me just ask a random question. Um, so, Roslyn, thank you, Kelia. So, Roslyn, what do you see as the advantages and disadvantages of running an, an NGO in the Caribbean? Well, you know, like Kalia says, it brings about a sense of national pride. Being able, I may never be able to join the army. I may never be a police officer. I might be a nurse. You know, you can't do those big things. But you can do <clears throat> small things in your own space. To make changes and to feel proud about your country and what you are actually contributing while you're here on this earth. And so this is the pride that I feel being part of the NGO and specifically in the work that we do, because this is not just a Trinidad and Tobago problem. It's a worldwide issue. And everybody has to do their part in their own space to help address the issue of waste management. So I, I really feel good when I see the recycle bins full to overflowing. Some people see that as a problem. Some people say, come and you remove this bin because it overflowed. I see that as, yay, we got the message across, you know? So you feel good about what you're doing in this particular space. I like the fact that there are other like-minded individuals like yourself who doing your own part in your corner. 
And so when we go to workshops here in Trinidad, you get to discover every every time a new one pop up, you know, doing something different. Who would have ever thought about Connie Cycle? You know, you jump up and you, you use the costume and you throw it away and next year you go and you buy a new one. But that too is a waste that you probably would not have thought about. So I like the idea of going to these events and seeing other people doing their little part in different areas, because if we can all do our part, we could, you know, really enforce some sort of change and, and solve the problem. And I like to see, particularly for us, because we work with children, Sean and I were part of a camp this summer. And, you know, when it was done, she's like, oh gosh, you tie them out. <laughs> but, you know, you lo I love to see the children being excited about waste and the, the, the light bulbs go off in their head when you ask them, okay, when you throw something away, where is away? And they start to think about it, really, really think about it. Some things that we have not really um, addressed until we reach adults. But uh, waste management is part of their school curriculum. But there is such a disconnect because they, they learn it at the primary school level. They learn about the R's and the recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle. And then when you come home and you come into the community, there is no continuation. So this, this is what gives us joy doing what we do in our community. We don't only do it in our community. We go all over the country. As a matter of fact, we have presented our work at the United Nations Commission for the Status of Women. So we have gone far and wide shouting about what we're doing and being very excited. And that is the advantage, I think, for us. One of the disadvantages, I think, and what frustrates me is the disconnect, you know, where you're doing so much at this level and then you will go into a government organization and you will not even see a recycling bin. You know, uh, we, we, we put bins all over the place and we have what you call a national campaign, but there's no education to follow up the national campaign. So people would just see it as another bin and they will put all sorts of things in there. And this is what I think is the disadvantage and the disconnect because sometimes you reach to the point where you ask yourself, is it really working? Is it really worth it? You know, yeah. you get on a high today and then tomorrow you're going to another community and you're like, like you just get deflated, you okay. know? And one of the other disadvantages for us, and I want to go back on that funding issue, is where sometimes we you see grant opportunities advertised and then you go down the list and Trinidad and Tobago is not one of the countries on the list. Because we have oil, they see us as a rich country. And they think that we have all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed, but that is not the case. There is money, but not necessarily to do the work that we do, right? And there are organizations that offer in this funding, but when, when they, you know, the larger scheme of things, we don't qualify. So that is one of the disadvantages, I think, being from an oil rich country <laughs> and not being able to access real funding to do the work that we do. Two things. One, on the opportunity to, uh, we went to Panama recently and met the, uh, the head of the organization, uh, his excellency, Monsoon. And uh, I told him that quote from Annie Renner that said there's no such thing as a way. When you throw something away, it must end up somewhere. And he was like, say it again, say it again. <laughs> You know, because I'm like, it's very, it's very true. People think it's an out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. It's just going to disappear. Um, but guys, we now actually have questions rolling in. So I'm going to be splitting questions among you all um, and also monitoring the time. Right, Danny? So I'm going to ask you a very different question, okay? So the question for you is from Hannah. Uh, and guys, I'm just choosing questions at random. So don't worry. I'm going to try to get them on as much as I can. Um, so Hannah asks, there are a lot of NGOs across the Caribbean working on very similar projects. Do you think there is enough collaboration between NGOs in different countries? And that's why in this conversation, I always try to have multiple organizations. We're supposed to have another organization from Grenada, but you guys know Hurricane Beryl passed, and it was completely devastating to the island of Grenada. So they are not able to join us at this call today. So our question is, do you think there's enough collaboration between NGOs and different countries? Is there a need for more Caribbean-wide collaboration? So, Danny, I'll, I'll ask you that. Um, from my lens, we have tried to do that. 
um, and I'll go into it. But to overall answer your question, I don't feel there's enough happening that I'm aware of, but we have tried to be the change we want to see. So um, we know, as I told you um, before, just in different communities of Trinidad and Tobago, there's different cultures and um, different habits and just different ways of living just within a country. So let's just say we tried to go and do costume recycling in Barbados or Jamaica. That's completely different than how Carnival is ran in Trinidad and Tobago. So we've actually facilitated costume recycling in both those countries um, and Miami in the USA but we collaborated with local NGOs to do that because they know Jamaica and Barbados and Miami better than I do. So um, actually for Jamaica, we did it in 2019 and we partnered with JET, which um, Kalia just mentioned, um, because they also had did a Nadatia Carnival campaign. And so we partnered with them um, to be part of that campaign. And then we also partnered with local, they, they told us where were the, where the best places were to set up collection bins. Um, they told, they gave us contact to the local mass bands um, and they helped us by going to the fest that they were already promoting at to go and basically promote to revelers um, who were going to jump up in the parade that, hey, we're doing this costume recycling. So by partnering with a local NGO, we were able to find out the best places to go promote, the best places to set up our collection bins. And by the way, this was the very first time we were doing this costume recycling <laughs> campaign. So they helped us tremendously. And um, we wouldn't have had that knowledge and it would have been 10 times as harder if we didn't collaborate with a local organization. We did the same in Barbados. Um, oh, and they also helped us figure out what, what um, who are the best organizations to donate some of the material to as well. So we did the same thing in Barbados and then we did the same thing in Miami with the Clean Hearts campaign. Um, and yeah, they just knew the, the best places to set up, the best events to go to. And it took off a lot of legwork from some organization coming from a different country to do their work um, um, or to, yeah, to promote their, their initiative um, through that collaboration. It took off like, 90% of the work just through collaborating um, versus trying to find all the answers on your own when someone has that knowledge. And it would be the local environmental NGO that has that knowledge. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely think collaboration across countries is possible, but I do think I would like to see more of that. Okay. Awesome. I, I agree. I think sometimes also, I mean, thinking of bigger projects, um, in the cross country collaboration would would definitely make it better because you all win when you collaborate. So thank you so much for that, Danny. So next question, I'm gonna ask it to Kelia. It is from I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, so don't come to my neck if I don't. It's a Kai to Mixer Nagaka. Um, looking at the situation and the concern about waste management. So Kelia, this is your question, okay? Looking at the situation and the concern about waste management, do you think NGOs have enough relevant experts to tackle the situation? So Kelia, what do you think? Do you think the NGOs have enough experts to tackle the situation based on how you see things happening in waste management? So it's difficult to speak on behalf of everybody because of course I don't know what expertise in other NGOs are seeking but of course when it comes to the nitty-gritty you create a budget line item for the expertise you will need so I would I would hope people are considering that um, in projects where they require that expertise um, in our case, for example, we have a connection in Indonesia um, and Indonesia has a very similar problem to us when it comes to dumping garbage in the gullies and it ending up in the ocean. 
And so we did a trip to Indonesia and met up with various waste management uh, experts, companies, both NGOs and for-profit um, kind of social enterprises and gathered all the information. So I think I, I can speak to the importance of speaking, speaking expertise, um, super important, but also in a conversation, interestingly enough, over there in Indonesia, we spoke to a team who initially had a group of scientists and environmentalists, and they said when they changed out their, their team to business-minded people, the, the NGO transformed. Because typically, because we're so used to, to grants and working um, as a nonprofit, maybe we don't think about building our organization in a way where it's self-sufficient. Um, and so they found it more beneficial to have a team of business minded individuals versus environmentalists and not don't take my word for anything. But I just thought it was their company um, became more self-sufficient um, and successful, quote unquote, at resolving the waste issue. Um, basically, what they did is they collected large amounts of waste from communities um, and they separated the mixed waste and sent it off to various recyclers in Indonesia. Uh, so, yeah, expertise is super important, and I'd advise all NGOs to seek it when necessary, of course. Wow, thank you for that. I mean, that is something that has been actively done. I'm only saying that because he has my number and she's poor. <laughs> Right. Um, but yeah, having sometimes you may not have the expertise in house, but you also have to know where the gaps are and if there is someone who can support you through that. As I say, I have a bunch of blind items, you say, All right, I need somebody who can do this. Let me put it in my budget so that I can, you know, bring that person on board uh, to really help us take the, the project or the campaign or whatever, um, whatever that you're working on today. To the next level, I think you know, understanding and recognizing that sometimes you may not have it within yourself, but I might know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who has it. Then you know that is your way to to go. So we're gonna have two more questions. I'm going to ask this question um, for Phil. I answered someone asked a question anonymously, which I answered in the in the Q and A box. They asked about um, is there any one organization on industry body? specifically for plastic in the Caribbean. Um, and my response was, yeah, we, we have no one singular body responsible for plastics in the Caribbean region. They are multi, it's a multi-sectoral, multi-agency um, approach as it pertains to plastics that can be seen as a good and a bad thing, right? So the other question that we have from Phil, um, so I'm going to ask to see if you guys want to tackle this one. If not, I could probably just answer it. That's not a problem at all. He said, given the large tourist industry, are the governments considering or would they consider an equity? I think in Trinidad, we might have, there might have been some talk. I don't know, Russ, then you could probably let me know. Would they consider an equal fee for tourists to go into a sustainability fund? Example, ten dollars US per person. I've seen certain countries. I think the Philippines are doing it. Some other countries are doing it, where they charge visitors an equal fee, right? And then that just goes back into uh, a lot of money. So, Rosalind, from your perspective, do you think that would work for us in the Caribbean region charging an equal fee? What do you think? I think because of the kind of tourists that Trinidad attracts, it may not work here. Although okay. we are Trinidad and Tobago, we attract two different types of tourists. So the more business right. tourists comes to Trinidad, they come have a weekend, a meeting, a week of meetings, and then they go back to the country, stay in the hotel. So they don't go about the place as much. But then we have the tourists that go to Tobago. Those are the ones who would probably come for carnival and then they go to Tobago and cool down. And perhaps that would work more in uh, the Tobago space. But what we do have in Trinidad is something that is called the Green Fund, where everybody who lives on the island contributes to the Green Fund. When you put gas in your car, a percentage goes into the Green Fund. Uh, when you pay your taxes, uh, your business levy, 
and all of that, a percentage goes into the Green Fund. And so what the Green Fund is supposed to do, uh, it's supposed to provide funding for organizations like us to do our work and, you know, uh, do whatever education and awareness is there to get the change that we're trying to enforce. But once again, uh, sometimes when you do things like that on a national level, does it trickle down? That is where the challenge is. So even if they were to set up an eco fee for tourists, will that money trickle down to the NGOs underground that is doing the work? I'm not too sure about that. And that is where the challenge lies. Yes, you will charge the tax and the tax will go where all the other taxes go. But mm -hmm. when it comes to implementing or um, getting part of that to do your work, it doesn't really work out like that all the time. Yeah, and let me know that. that. And yes, and let me know that there are some other challenges associated with accessing the green funds. Um, yes. You know, so then that's another issue um, that gets presented as well. So guys, so we are about to wrap up our conversation this morning. We're talking to three fantastic people with NGOs uh, in waste management, Western Jobs, from Patrick Adams Community Council, Kelia Hall, who's a sustainability manager at the SUM Foundation in Jamaica, and Danny McCletty, who is the co-founder of China Cycle in Trinidad and Tobago. So the last question I would ask you guys to wrap up the conversation. So this is for each of you. What are your top three recommendations moving forward? So we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of running an NGO. We talked about the challenges and the opportunities. So given all of that you said, what are your top three things moving forward? What do you want our participants to take with them from based on your organization and to carry forward? Go ahead, husband, you can start this. Well, um, first, I would say to continue to be encouraged. <laughs> it might seem stressful. It might seem difficult at times. But, you know, like Kalia said earlier on, the passion is from within. So it's not something that you could just put on and put take off when times get tough. So we have to encourage ourselves and hope that things will get better. That's one. The second one I would say is more collaboration. It came out in the conversation that we need to work together locally and throughout the Caribbean region. Yeah, we need to have a lot more um, dialogue between ourselves and this is a good start. And um, perhaps the third thing would be to shout a little louder because we can't continue to be frustrated and feeling like you're swimming upstream all of the time. We need to have a louder voice and enforce the change that we um, want the government and other stakeholders to make as far as our work is concerned. So that's my top three. Thanks, Rosalind. Danny, what are your top three? I would say um, the first one would be don't be afraid to think outside the box. So, you know, costume recycling at a large scale is very abstract and um, it hadn't been done before. There were no resources we could rely on Google to figure out how to effectively do it. So it was definitely by trial and error from, you know, cleaning the costumes to breaking them down to figure out what was the fastest, most effective way to do it, even from the collection um, thing. But I would do it over again because it's something I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about carnival and the environment and just merging the two was something <laughs> I didn't even think that I was going to think of doing or be inspired to do, but it was something that I think is really important, especially as our culture is being exported um, globally and it's now we have over 150 different carnivals and that same waste is being generated over and over again. Um, so definitely don't be afraid to step outside the box. Secondly, use your resources, whether that be your own knowledge, like, you know, outside of Carnegie Cycle, I'm an environmental professional. So I have that coming with me, but not only do I have the knowledge I gained from experience or school, but I have resources. I have a network. I have Shan, who has invited me to this webinar to spread my message. Um, I have a big network in Trinidad Tobago of other NGOs. Me and Rosalind has been, this is our second call together. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, you can't do this journey alone. So definitely like reinforcing what Rosalind said on collaboration, but through you know, using your network um, when you 
are having a barrier that's over um that's like hard to overcome you're actually better off asking for help than trying to figure it out all on your own so definitely um don't be afraid to step outside the box um use your resources and then um don't be afraid to make mistakes because you know things are just not always going to be going smoothly you know the first you know three the first two three carnivals we collected like 23 costumes and then like you know 60 something the next one and we kept learning what we did wrong to now where we collect 5,000 costumes but if we gave up at like 60 something costumes because we're like nobody's buying into the program, you know, we would never get to the point where we're not collecting five, 6,000 costumes. Um, and that happens from an iterate, iterative process of making mistakes and learning and continuing the journey. So those are my three recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Olaf. Yes. I'll keep it brief because I see it's 901. First of all, I was just soaking up that advice. Um, it's it's there are things that I needed to hear. That, so thank you, Rosalyn and Danny. Um, very nice to be on a call and be able to relate. I haven't been in a situation like this for some time, so I really needed it. Um, from my perspective, I was thinking more from say a business perspective, if there's anyone on the call who has a business and is in a position to make that kind of decision, that if you do have money for CSR, for example, in Jamaica, I think a lot of businesses do a beach cleanup, you know, um, and it's just once a year and they could have taken that money and put it towards something else that would have been a lot more meaningful and impactful and um, maybe you know, put it through an organization that's already doing work to ensure that um, there's impact there in an existing program. So that's one thing from the business perspective. Um, in terms of NGOs, a lesson I've learned in terms of, we've learned, my team has learned in terms of maximizing our impact is working for the upstream. I've, I've said it maybe two more times on this call, but um, you know, for example, right now we're thinking about building a structure over the gullies to beautify the area, but also prevent people from putting anything in the gullies. And that would make life a lot easier for people downstream who are trying to clean up the garbage. Um, and lastly, as individuals, whether you're in an NGO, business, government, not just a, you know, person in your day to day life, I always tell people, I think, reusable Adaptation is one of the biggest things we can do. We purchase food and drink. Um, some people every single day, if you buy lunch from home, maybe not so much, but it seems so small. And people think, you know, just taking a water bottle or a fork, like what change is that really going to make? But if we all did a lot of these things, a lot would change. So I have my water bottle here. I know many of you on the call have your water bottle as well. I have my reusable utensils set in my bag, yes. <laughs> Um, you know, something really, really small, but every single day you're, you know, choosing option A instead of B, it makes a big difference. You see, there are other people in this whole series who have a simpler brain like me. You know, I want to tell you, if any day you forget, just give yourself a little grace, there's no risk of all. Okay? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, you're right. You're most welcome. So, guys, I want to say a huge thank you to you, to you all for firstly being here with me today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I, you know, I'm very, very selective when I choose who I want to be um on my webinars, and I'm so, so happy that I chose all of you. I also wanted to use this opportunity for you guys to get to know each other a little bit better. So Hannah, that question about yeah, collaboration can also happen across your country. Um, because if there is a lesson that Rosalind started off in plastic, she's branching off into composting and doing all of the other wonderful things that her organization is doing. You know, but if there are some things that you, know, you would have done in that Roslyn knows or think that Roslyn would have done that can help you, you know, it's always great to, you know, to share with each other. You lose nothing by sharing. I think that, that is something that people still have yet to understand. You lose nothing by sharing. Um, and so my first thanks to all of you, my second thanks to Twitter for always being 
the consummate organizer of everything. Um, you know, she has been with me from the very, very beginning. Uh, that's super guy. Thank you. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us today from wherever you are coming from. So many different Romania, so many different countries, you know, and um, all this. Uh, please that speech when we have so many different people joining us. Um, I always like to close our conversations with my my favorite quote is, is my life mantra is not always about doing things better, but sometimes we simply need to do better things. So let's continue to do better things. Everyone in the waste management space, our sweetheart is going to share, um, you know, the contact information. You guys want to see so if you have questions, if you want to support them, like well. Meaningful support, I'm not jokey support. Sorry, my little training is coming out now, but they don't want jokey support, they want meaningful support, right? Uh, something that can help them grow, scale, and move the needle a little bit. That's what we're talking about. So, if you know somebody who knows somebody who is interested in the Caribbean region, who's looking for an opportunity to collaborate, who has some money to send them something that you can just give them, yeah, just give it the things now, just give it the things, right? So Thank you so much, Myanmar. That's one of the countries I have to visit. So Myanmar, I have to visit your family sometimes, but that's that's on my list. <laughs> but I want to thank you so much, everyone. Um, feel free to connect with me as well on LinkedIn. So I will tell you what to speak up. Just leave a confusing comment. Sweet up. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Rosalind, Danny, and Talia. It was a very interesting conversation. Thanks a lot to the audience. Several of you have stayed on, though the webinar went on a little longer, actually, which is always a good thing. I've dropped a link to other webinars of Sean on uh, the chat, and all of them are pretty easy to catch on LinkedIn. Everyone is available on LinkedIn. So uh, let me just quickly drop Sean's uh, LinkedIn profile here. Uh, she always has something very interesting to say on her LinkedIn. So please uh, connect with her there. And the others are also very easy to get on LinkedIn. Otherwise, you can ping us on connectedpastewise.b and we'll send you their LinkedIn profiles or email IDs. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a, uh, a good day to all the panelists. I know your day has just started. And to wherever the rest of you are, good afternoon, good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>